Thanks for listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Mike Luke, joined by the venerable John Schuster, the precocious Ben White, an X Division I athlete, and Craig Bergman, a.k.a. Matt Muehlbach. Guys, let's just get down to it. This was the first... This, to me, is... This is the signature point of the Jed Fish uh, regime to this point, in that Washington State is a good team, and Arizona... Just beat the living snot out of them, uh, Craig Bergman, then John Schuster, then Ben White. They punched him in the nose, didn't they? Hey, by the way, is this a basketball podcast? Is this Arizona at Duke? I this, this was Arizona at Duke. It, that's what it feels like. Right? I mean, man, I'll tell you what. I've been watching Arizona football since 1987 when I came on my recruiting trip. This was one of the bigger victories I've seen in a long, long time. Incredible stuff right there for an Arizona, especially I'll tell you what, after you lose a heartbreaking game last week, heartbreaking, one of the one of the toughest losses in the last 10 years, and you go up to the Palouse, I've been up there many times, that is a very, very tough place to just travel to, not to mention play well and win. So hats off to the Arizona football team and all the football people. Schuster, yeah, this was across the board. The Schuster, across the board, offense, defense. This was a team effort here. And you mentioned it uh, to me uh, earlier in the week where you said, this team actually feels for the first time like they have good players. Or, you know, across the board, there's depth there. Just kind of expand on what you've seen and what you saw out there. Well, I I, I think it's safe to say that this is what? Pro- probably Arizona's most complete game in, what, 10 years at yeah. least? You know, and there are a lot of folks I know who are going to go back and kind of look to try to track one down. But as you noted, Mike, it's certainly the signature win uh, in the fish era. And one of the things that, you you know, aside from the generality of Arizona's talent, which obviously has improved, one of the things we talked about, I think, in another forum a couple of years ago was that we have this idea, we, we tend to break things down into the cleanliness of years. Like year one's going to be this, and then year two's going to be this, and then year three's going to be this, and you hope to have something happen in year four. But I remember us discussing that sometimes there's a game where if things are going the right way or the wrong way during the course of a season, that right. allows a team to progress significantly more than they're probably supposed to. And there's a lot of football still on the slate. But Arizona obviously played very well. And as opposed to being in a position where, you know, three or four weeks ago, you're looking at the gauntlet in front of you and wondering if Arizona's, even though Arizona's clearly got better talent, whether they're going to be in a position where they can cobble enough W's together uh, to be bowl eligible. Now you start to kind of swing the pendulum a little more and start wondering if Arizona can run the table here. Uh, You you know, there are obviously some extraordinarily difficult games remaining on the slate. Uh, But, you know, and I think it's kind of interesting in that we're going to probably look at Arizona, depending on obviously how things go. If Arizona goes on a really nice run and starts to dominate teams across from them, uh, you you start to you know be in a position where you look back at the Washington State game as the game where Arizona really made the strides. But I think you can f- fairly, I think you can make a good argument that the second half against Washington perhaps was the turning point. And uh, so certainly the way that they performed in a game against UCL, uh, rather USC, uh, where they were, I think the better football team for most of that game and got themselves into trouble with a multitude of penalties that cut down on the penalties today. And what uh, Muehlbach said in regards to them, uh, you know, obviously being a much better product out there is certainly the case. Uh, and, and, And it looks like Arizona has a lot of positives. This was a breakthrough performance. Now can you build on it? That's one of the tests. But you like being in that position where that test is in front of you as opposed to, uh, as Muehlbach noted last week, you know, when you lose a heartbreaker like that and then go to Pullman, this game went entirely differently than I expected it to. Uh, and, and from a Wildcat perspective, I'm glad that it did. And I think, Ben, we've talked about it a lot uh, when I was visiting up in L.A., but this is a uh, this is Noah Fafita's this is Noah Fafita's job at this point. Uh, Jade, I, I know Jed Fish will probably come out and say when Jaden Delora is healthy, he is going to be the starter. He that you can't at this stage in the game. If you put Jaden Delora and uh, if you put Jaden Delora in and you start up against Oregon State, 
you take away and you sap all the really big time momentum that you have right here. And it won't make any sense. Again, Noah Fafita is that dude, Ben, than Craig Bergman. Yeah, I mean, it, it all came to fruition tonight. I mean, we saw against Washington, you're one score away from upsetting the seventh ranked team in the country. You saw last week against USC losing a heartbreaker, as you guys noted. In double overtime, you were this close away, probably just a little bit of a better play call away from upsetting USC. And tonight you really saw Arizona put it all together for the first time in what feels like years. I mean, I think we've talked all about this roster and how improved it is across both sides of the line. We've talked about the secondary and just the talent that Jed Fish has been able to bring in here. But the difference tonight is, like you said, Mike, Fafita, obviously, but turnovers, man, three turnovers. I didn't expect Arizona to smack Wazoo, but I think this roster has shown up and down on both sides of the ball that it can't compete with anybody in the Pac-12. And Fafita making his third start, 34-43, 342 yards. He opened it up, man. These just weren't these weren't just checkdowns. I thought there were a couple of nice play action plays to T Mac and some of the other receivers. Arizona got everybody involved. And like you said, it's clear to me that Fafita is the captain and the quarterback of this offense. It shouldn't be a question at this point. Matt, See, you, uh, you texted and, 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 me. Go ahead. Go ahead, you. No, go ahead, no, you. Quick. Quickly. Oh, okay. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, Matt. Um, I don't think there's a controversy. I, I, I think this is, this is the only controversy created here right now is based on people wondering or trying to create a, a controversy because look at it from an action standpoint versus a, a, a comment standpoint. Jed Fish can say that Dolores is starter, but if he starts Fafita, then the action is what matters. He's not going to start Dolores. I mean, I, I, it's just, uh, there's, there's just, I don't think Jed Fish is that dumb. Uh, and right, right now, based on the momentum, like you guys said, Fafita's the guy. And I would be surprised if, you know, that the, the, the Delora isn't anything. And Delora certainly has all kinds of potential. But it's clear that Fafita is a better quarterback. And I think it's probably also clear that Fish is going to start him. Right now, Matt, you met you messaged me during the game. <laughs> Look at me texting with Matt Muehlbach during the game. <laughs> um, and uh, you said, "Is Noah Fafita is this as good a quarterback as Arizona's had?" You know, with the exception of Nick Foles, I mentioned Keith Smith in there. And again, I, I know it's not a perfect comparison, but to me, there's a little bit of Keith Smith in him in the way that he climbs the pocket. He doesn't, he's a pretty accurate quarterback. His arm is good enough. He can't run quite like Keith Smith, but there's a sense of confidence when he's out there. There, it just kind of oozes just kind of a next level feel that you really need to have from a quarterback. And maybe if I was talking to a division one athlete right now, he might know about that. <laughs> no, he, 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 you put me in my place, which was great because I said he's the best quarterback I've seen at Arizona since I've been in Tucson other than Nick Foles. And you're right, Keith Smith, he's not Keith Smith yet. And Keith Smith, the way he ran the ball, what he did to command the offense. Um, but Noah's right there. And as you said, Keith runs it a little better. Uh, to use a basketball analogy, Noah reminds me a little bit of Jason Gardner. Undersized, but just a stud. You know, when he has the ball in his hands, you feel good about what's going to happen. He makes great decisions. He's he has unbelievable poise. That's to me the the word that comes to mind when I see him. And again, in the last 35 whatever years, all due respect to my name down there, Craig Bergman, my guy who I roomed with in the 1987-88 Final Four run, Craigie <laughs> Bergman. But Craig lost his job to Ronnie Veal because they ran the run and shoot. And I love Ronnie Veal, by the way, one of my favorite guys. I came in with him in 1987. But Noah is the guy. And I'm not sure, you know, and you were kind of, you know, you were you were throwing out my name that we were texting. Hey, I texted with Steve Kerr during the game. And what did Steve Kerr say? Noah. He just said Noah. That was it. And that's all you need to know right now. That's really it, Ben. And watching it up close, you and I were at the SC game. And the one thing about the SC game, too, that really stuck out, and Schuster mentioned this as well, is that the Arizona defense – this is a good defense now. It feels weird yeah. to say it's not a bet, but don't break. They can get after the passer, but also when they're in man coverage, when they showed air, when they showed uh um, excuse me, when they sh showed Cam Ward running around, there weren't a lot of open windows to be able to throw it to there, Mister Ben One White. 
I couldn't pick apart, and I watched it very closely. I couldn't pick apart one play where Wazoo receiver or collection of receivers were able to separate pretty significantly. I thought the DBs played the best performance of the season. I think that's the best performance we've seen from an Arizona secondary, quite honestly, in years. We talked about guys like Maldonado, who have struggled all year. He did fantastic. Obviously, other guys in that secondary. And you're exactly right. I mean, USC was really the telling card because it's Los Angeles. It's Southern California. These kids are from here. I don't care what anybody says. I know everybody wants to win every single game, but that USC game may, means a lot more to a lot of those guys, and they take it very personally. And the fact that they played the way they did, they were able to carry that momentum into tonight. And Arizona, just like you said, they have quality depth. I mean, we talked about Russell Davis last week. Tonight it was Jacob K, as we're going to call him on this show. Uh, guys who you can rotate beyond just that first line. How many times have Mike, have we been able to say that, you know, not only an undersized Arizona defensive line, we pick on guys like Parker Zellers and whatnot over the years, but you're able to get quality guys outside of that first five. And it really showed tonight because Cam Ward was very uncomfortable. Um, didn't make a lot of good decisions. Didn't really have a ton of time in the pocket, tried to extend plays, but even when he extended plays and was able to move around a little bit, there was just nowhere for him to go with the football because those DBs were locked on their receivers, all of them one-on-one. So as good as Fafita was, I mean, I've got to give the tip of the cap to the defense tonight because this looks like one of the best defenses, obviously, in the Pac-12, if not the country. I think they were top 25 uh, last week in terms of rankings and statistics just across Division One college football. I'd only imagine, Mike, that's going to go up now. By the way, Tony Jones in here. We saw A.J. Jones with the catch. We've been calling for more A.J. Jones. Very good work, Tony. Proud of you right there. Schuster, um, let's talk about this defensive line here a little bit, and then we get to Bergman on this one as well. We've watched a lot of undersized Arizona defensive lines that make up for not being able to get after the passer by being as slow as me. This is a lot different now. Big Bill Norton in the middle has been a monster. Big Bill Norton, the Big Bill Morton fan club right here. You've obviously got Upshaw. You've got um, Tia Savea had a good game. Manoa across the board. This is a good defensive line. It's not just a bend but don't break. It's actually a playmaking defensive line, Shoe. Yeah, and the Kong kid, uh, you might as well throw into that conversation yeah, as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there is a, uh, yeah, uh, and, and there are some folks who I think go, you know, in football circles who kind of go through the debate on, you know, what direction you want to go to try to improve on a respective side of the ball, and and defense is a little easier kind of a, to break down, I think, in this regard than offense, because the debate be begins with, do you start with the line, do you start with linebacker, do you start with the secondary, and a lot of teams tend to do it. Uh, on the extremes. They want to get significantly better on the line and then later hope to trickle it down to be significantly better in the secondary. That's all. Or the line puts so much pressure on that it can cover maybe some deficiencies in the secondary. It appears to me that Arizona's good at both. And that right. allows them to be in a position where they can cause the havoc that they have caused uh, for good portions of uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, additionally, UCLA defensively gave them a blueprint against Washington State last week, uh, and and that was that that's one of the uh, Washington State is going through a serious crisis right now, and it would not surprise me if they're a team that started out four and one and maybe isn't bowl eligible, uh, which is if you looked at them two weeks ago against a really good Oregon State team, a team right. that as of this podcast at the moment is leading UCLA by nineteen in the late in the fourth quarter. Washington State was a notably better football team than Oregon State was that day. That was two weeks ago. Then they go, right. then, uh, maybe three. They had the bye week, and then they went to UCLA. UCLA overmatched them. And today it was much worse. So in addition to Arizona having personnel, they were able, uh, the other team that they're going to see on the schedule also helped them from a scouting standpoint, and Arizona was able to implement that scouting report very well. They have no problem playing man-to-man -man, uh, from, from a secondary standpoint, cornerback standpoint, and they're also able to get pressure. That's a great combination that's going to make it difficult on uh, the other teams remaining on the schedule. And on top of that, our guy, Fam, Rayshon Speedy Luke got into the mix right there. You got more and more guys coming off here right now. There's a little, there's a, there's a fast, there's a, it's weird, Matt, because when, when Fish takes somebody out, Michael Wiley is a very good running back. 
But I think the running back situation right now certainly bears itself out as to the depth that this team has that you could bring in a guy like Rayshon Speedy Luke, fam, as we affectionately call him here. Jonah Coleman is an absolute monster. DJ Williams, the talent across the board is fantastic depth wise right there. Well, you know, I'm going to use a, a, a basketball analogy here with Tommy Lloyd, how he changed the, the, the roster construction this year from last year. And Jed Fish has done that, right? He, when he came in, he, he, he said one of the first things he's going to do is create some good O-line and D-line. Their O-line is unbelievable. That O-line is incredible, as we know. But to go out then and, and recognize, obviously, the need for defense and then go get defensive players, go get depth at running back go get depth at receiver you know i I mean i've said it i say it all all the time i mean if you're gonna have great teams you gotta have great talent you gotta have great coaching you gotta have great chemistry and all three of them arizona's getting there yeah they may not be washington or oregon yet but you know by all accounts you watch them and they're playing toe to toe you know i mean you could tell washington was probably a better team but the way they played Washington, the way Arizona did a few a couple of weeks ago, um, the way they're now playing USC head to head in LA, I mean, I just I give I give that staff a ton of credit, give Jed a ton of credit. I was hanging out. I'll I'll, uh, I'll throw a couple other names out there this week. I, I was at an event, saw Teddy Bruschi, but you know Ricky Hunley, um, Chuck Cecil, some of the coaches that Jed's brought in, and if you look historically over Arizona football, the great Arizona football teams over the last 30, 40 years, had unbelievable assistant coaches. And I look I look along yeah, the line point. there, and they've got some really good assistants. Right. Now, um, Ben, what do you – going forward here, this is where it gets fascinating for me because we've always said all offseason that this needs to be – The bowl, getting into a bowl, I don't care what it is. It can be the back the A bowl. It can be the weed eater bowl, whatever it is. That is the goal getting into year three. And this feels very much like a bowl team right here. Somebody put on there the best four and three team in the country. I don't know that that's not the fact, but listen, with what Jed Fish inherited, if you're going bowling in year three, that is a fantastic win right there. It's the way you've done it too, right? I mean, Matt just talked about everything from, having an A-plus coaching staff just to the overhaul of roster. And I think just the nature of college football, yeah, it makes it easier with NIL and some of the new rules over the years, but it also makes it a little bit harder, especially those middle ground programs like Arizona where a coach like Fish has to come in and really figure out, okay, what is our niche and what is our selling point? And to come in as quickly as he has and get the players that he needs and put them in positions to be where they are right now it's remarkable. I mean, we talk about Dion, what he's done at Colorado. He's very much on his way to doing there. But I mean, you see it around here and there. But outside of that, I mean, it's not really a, a huge thing in college football to see a program, quite honestly, go from one to two wins two years later to being bowl eligible. So you look at the way they've played tonight. You look at the trajectory of the schedule. You you take care of business tonight. You've got Oregon State at home, UCLA, Colorado, Utah. You're telling me one or two more wins at the very least can't come from that. I think uh, we're very much on our way to going bowling there, Mike. And go ahead. Now, Mike. I'm generally wrong on pretty much everything, but I did pick Arizona to win this game today. And you might say, Mike Luke, where could I bet on these games right here? Well, thanks for asking. Bet MGM right here. This is what you do. You sign up for Bet MGM. You use bonus code PHNX. Place your first Bet MGM sportsbook wager through the Bet MGM sportsbook mobile app of at least ten dollars. You will receive two hundred dollars in additional winnings, regardless of your wager's outcome. Check out the show notes for details. Also, if you want to bet on a good team with somebody that roots for a good team, bet on the Kansas City Chiefs. They are good. They are going to win a lot of games. Also, back the A. Check it out. Let's hear the disclaimer real quick from Shane Diefenbach. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Colorado, D.C., Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, New Jersey, Nevada, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, Wyoming. Call 877-8-HOPE-N-Y or text HOPE-N-Y-467-369, New York. Call 1-800-327-5050, Massachusetts. 21 plus to wager. Please gamble responsibly. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP, Arizona. 1-800-BETS-OFF, Iowa. 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help, Michigan. 1-800-981-0023, Puerto Rico, in partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. U.S. promotional offers not available in D.C., New York, or Ontario. Also, Matt, when was the last time you went to Circle K? Be honest. Be honest. Wow. Um, I got gas there two days ago. 
That's all we need. If Matt Mulebach can go to get Matt Mulebach can get gas there. I was actually at the one at Grant and Oracle. I, again, I'd like to try to get my street cred a little bit, check out the uh, people, be a mingle with the folks, but it was great there. And that's what Circle K does. They deliver for everybody. They deliver for Matt Mulebach. They deliver for me. They can deliver for anybody. Check it out. Join the inner circle for free by downloading the Circle K app today. Terms and conditions apply at participating locations. Visit circlek.com for details. All right, shoot. No Fafita. Again, this is this is the elephant in the room. It's a tall, it's a small elephant, but it's still an elephant. Um, the way that he's also able to extend plays is very, very impressive. He made a couple throws. There was that play to T Mac where he led him down the uh, sideline and he hit him between the safety and the uh uh safety and the cornerback, where it didn't look like a freshman out there. It looked like somebody that has been doing this for quite a while. He's a pretty poised kid out there. And I think the Gardner comparison is actually somewhat interesting there, Shu. That's a pretty solid comparison. I like that as well. Man, yeah. that Muehlbach knows his football. Man, I, oh boy. <laughs> Every team he likes wins somehow. It's Muehlbach magic. Uh, so somehow even Craig's going to get victories here now that he's part of uh, Muehlbach's name magic. Uh, I. I noticed one of the comments below, and I apologize for not uh, remembering specifically who it was, who said that when Fafita made the throw in the uh, on third down uh, at the beginning of the second half, that was pretty much the nail in Washington State's coffin. And I think that's pretty accurate. That was the last gasp, I think, that the Cougars had of hoping to try to get back into the game after Arizona had controlled uh, the output. And when he made that pass, it's kind of like, okay, we don't have an answer for this guy. He's going to do whatever he wants, and that's exactly what Arizona did. Again, as far as I'm concerned, there's no small elephant in the room. I will harp on this just to be, an, 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 I guess, my typical annoying contrarian self. There is no quarterback controversy. Fafita is the starter. There's only a quarterback controversy unless he isn't. So right now, he's the starter. The end. He's earned it. He's better. He gives Arizona the best opportunity to win games, and I think he's um, when the opportunity has presented itself, he has shown that. I don't expect Jed Fish to start Jaden Delora. I expect Jed Fish to start Fafita. Simple, period. Uh, so, so, so in terms of elephants, small, large, big trunks, small trunks, lots of ivory, no ivory, none of it matters. Fafita is your starting quarterback, and we'll see what happens with Arizona. <laughs> ben White, you disagree with this. I don't. I don't. Um, I think Fafita clearly gives them the best chance to win. It's not necessarily about who's the most talented or flashy player. It's it's about fit and it's about moving the ball. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I gr granted Fafita's got a little bit of a smaller sample size, but now in what three starts? Explain to me the difference between QB one and QB two. Like if we sit down and we put the tape up and we compare JDL and Fafita and we make a list of things that one quarterback's better at than the other. I'm not so sure JDL is is making it halfway up that list. I mean, we've talked about it. I, I think that from a talent standpoint, he can be very good. I just think he tends to be reckless with the football. I think that there are some challenges there that keeps Arizona from moving its offense forward. And you know what? Fafita's a smaller guy. He may not have the big flashy arm, but I'll tell you what, at times tonight, when he had to make plays, he made plays. We talked about it after USC. This kid is clutch. Um, whether it's T-Mac, whether it's Cowing, people want to call him Captain Checkdown. People want to call him a game manager. I don't think that's fair at all. I think he's a guy who gives Arizona the best chance to win. I think he's somebody who can move the ball down the field and, and also make those big explosive plays like we saw tonight when Arizona needed them, Mike. All right, AZ Cats G, $5 super snap right here, or super chat. You like that. How about the Las Vegas Bowl? I believe it's around the same time the Cats play Florida Atlantic and T-Mobile Arena. Mr. Burns fingers right here. I like there that. All right. Now, uh, Craig, a.k.a. Matt, <laughs> everybody's talking about Colorado. I watched Colorado last night. I believe that Arizona is going to beat Colorado. I What's unique to me about the schedule going forward is I don't believe that there's any team that Arizona can't beat. Now, again, Oregon State's going to be a tough game, no doubt about it. But between Air, between uh, uh, UCLA, Col or UCLA, Colorado, Arizona State, there's two wins to be had there, Mr. Bergman. I, I can't get over the, the whole uh, elephant uh, analogy with you right there. That 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 was one of the best podcast moments of the year, and I do have to say, look, look JDL is a great quarterback. I, I mean, 
we're, and, and I think what's cool about what's happening with this whole thing is that Afid is just playing well, but JDL's fantastic. But I can't get over the, the whole elephant thing. The whole elephant diatribe that Shu just went on, I want, it, I want that played back. I need to listen to that <laughs> once a day, and then I can go on. But you're right, Luke. And I will have to, I have to go back to say two things. One is you notice the flat build hat, flat brim hat I have right here. It's this beautiful. Is of Mike Luke. Luke. Your, your Ryan trademark. Sandberg. Is that a Ryan Sandberg hat? <laughs> is, that what, is that what Sandberg used to wear? Well, somebody said something about Ryan Sandberg in there. I don't know what it was. But, uh, yeah, either way, the flat brim hat. John Schuster despises so, so, the flat brim hat. The flat brim hat. I'm wearing this in honor of you. But you know what? I got to go back to that. You called the game today. You you called. I When I saw the tweet come out that you said Arizona was going to win, I didn't believe it. I just thought that the, the, you know, the facts, the circumstances did not line up at all. I thought you were way wrong. Me and Shu kind of thought the same thing. We've been through this before, but I'll give you credit, Mike Luke. Well, well you know, when you so pick Arizona you Mike to win Luke, every game. Mike Luke, later, I'm gonna right? I'm gonna shoot it back to you, Mike Luke. I mean, this is not a you know podcast of predictions, but you know, where does Arizona end up at the end of the year? Do they end up with six, seven, eight wins? Could they? Uh, guys, I mean, I'll throw it back at both of you after I uh, answer Matt Mulebach's question. I think this could be a seven win team. I really do. I don't see why this can't be a seven-win team. Daniel Martin said here, Mike said our DC is doing a great job. That's a big reason why here is because it doesn't feel fluky. With Rich Rod's teams, and again, I believe that Rich Rod was probably the best X's and O's coach that I've ever seen at the U of A. Um, I'm, I'm not one for hyperbole. Actually, I am. I specialize in hyperbole. But... Rich Rod did a great job, but you always felt though with Rich Rod's teams that there was always going to be a game you were going to lose 63 to seven because he couldn't out scheme and you were just going to be smaller. Shu, Ben, watching this team though, that doesn't feel fluky. It doesn't feel like you need 10,000 things to go right to be able to beat a good team. No, they're well-rounded. Uh, and, and that puts them, and one of the things that I think they did very well today was limit the stupid penalties that have hurt them for most of this year. Uh, and that, and, and you do little things like that and it's, it shows some improvement because then your talent can shine a little bit better and you're not dealing with on the offensive end, you know, first and 20 and on the defensive end, giving teams extra downs with, you know, teams that have good offenses. Um, Today's win gives Arizona, I think, a more realistic path to seven. Now, what I what I also think is kind of interesting here is that you have, if you're Oregon right now, even with the Washington setback today, and you're looking at that schedule, one of the things you start to say is, you know what? A lot of these other teams in the conversation have to play Arizona, and we don't. And, and that's a weird, you know, Arizona has a lot to say about how this conference can till, still shake down. There's a lot of sneaking in the back door that can take place because the league is good. It's, mm -hmm. you know, you're yeah. seeing, you're seeing a lot of teams that have inconsistencies and Arizona certainly falls under, you know, while this was a complete looking performance, Arizona's clearly a team, you know, that, that has some more, has a lot of work to do still, but you can, you, you've got a team in UCLA that last week looked really good against Washington State, and this week is getting controlled by Oregon State. Not necessarily surprising because they have an inconsistent freshman quarterback who, you know, what, a month ago they scored seven points at Utah. Uh, you have a Utah, so so UCLA has does some things really well and has some issues that are consistent conceivably problematic. I think their freshman QB threw an interception for a touchdown again today. I believe that's the third one this season. That's a lot. And, and, and you understand freshman quarterbacks go through who I were talking about, how awesome Arizona's freshman quarterback is uh, freshman quarterbacks right. go through growing pains. Utah. One of the commenters mentioned this Utah offensively is not consistent this year, had a very good game. Looked like they put it together against, uh, against Cal. I think Utah is the best defensive team in the conference. But their offense has been clearly ineffective for most of this year. Gives you an opportunity. Oregon State, I think, is really good, but not, um, and, and I mean, really good, but not unbeatable by any stretch in Tucson. Arizona's better than ASU. I think Arizona's a, probably should be a little bit more advanced than Colorado if they can limit the emotional swing that the Buffaloes are. Colorado's the type of team, we saw this last night, it's a great example. They can give up 40 and score 40. 
And you never know exactly where it's going to go. And sometimes if they get a huge lead, maybe it's difficult it's, it's difficult enough to catch up because time runs out against you. You might be in a position where you think you're up with a big lead and they, they make a rally. Arizona's more advanced. It's a game that Arizona probably should win, but I think that game's in Boulder. Not, not easy. And if Arizona goes through the growing pain of starting to get too full of itself and believes it's just going to go into that game and win without having to work hard at it, that's a problem. And I think we all believe that they're more advanced than ASU at this stage. So can you, you can make, I don't know that any of us think that Arizona is going to run the table close to, I guess, the comparison of the year before, uh, what was it, 92, where they were 10 and two. Yeah. So in 91, where they won six in a row, where they started out rough, they had the, Okay, I'm going to make a comparison that I probably shouldn't make. Do it for for historians out. I'm, I'm for historians out there. In that season, Arizona tied Oregon State, and I might have these in reverse. Uh, lost to Miami on a McLaughlin missed field goal that was about 55 yards, and it just missed in a game where their defense was awesome. I think the final was eight to seven, uh, and then tied Oregon State. 14-14 in a game where they didn't play particularly well at all. And then rattled off five or six wins and in November had a shot at going to the Rose Bowl. And even in those games, you know, some fluky stuff happened where they had opportunities to win and couldn't close the deal. This team has the two-point loss to USC in double overtime in a game where they're, you know, taking a team that's highly regarded with the defending Heisman champion, and they look better in that matchup, but don't quite get it. And instead of folding the next week, they actually regroup and play extraordinarily well. And I think that's one of the things to really take out of this. Mulebach and I expected Arizona to have an emotional letdown. You expected Arizona to continue to improve. And I think to Fish's credit, bringing in Brewski this week, bringing in Hunley this week, having having guys there who understood what it was to go through the process after a difficult loss. They did a very good job with the learning curve. And I remember listening earlier in the day where Fish said this was Arizona's best week of practice. I thought it, I thought it was lip service nonsense. Clearly he was right. And Arizona played, ex Arizona had an opportunity to fold today and let the lingering effects of last week's game work against them and instead used it as motivation. And now with the bye week, you start to look at the Wildcats as a team that can prob prob probably isn't going to win the conference. You know, there's a lot of things that have to wiggle their way through for Arizona to get to that point, but has a lot to say about who might. And what you guys said was a great point there, Ben, in that Colorado, if they're going to win games, those games all have to be in the 40s. They all have to be in the 50s. I get the sense, Ben, and then uh, Craig, that this does feel like a Arizona team that if it does come down to it against, say, Oregon State, and you've got to win a game 17 to 13, 13 to 10, that to me is probably the biggest difference, kind of the biggest juxtapose right now in that he uh, Arizona can win games that way. Not that they ha they haven't so far, but Arizona can win games that way. Well, I'll say this much. I mean, shoe hit on Utah. Outside of Utah, I think Arizona is the only defense in this conference that can consistently hold teams to 24 a few points a game. And when you're able to do that, it opens up a hell of a lot of opportunities for you. You saw it last week against USC. Granted, it was a little bit more uh, than that points-wise, but at the same time, you look at the quarterback play in this conference. It's very good. It, it's the best in all of college football. Oregon State, DJ is going to be no joke when it comes to that. Oregon State has shown the ability to put up points. They have a good run game. They have some good receivers. They can move the ball. Arizona has to bring its A game for that. UCLA, same thing. Their freshman quarterback has been all over the place. I don't know if he's somebody who they will be moving forward with ultimately after the season. But at the same time, UCLA has a very good defense. So, it comes down to if that run game is shut down just a little bit, if Fafita's getting rattled a little bit, how does he respond? Is he able to move the ball? Is he able to continue to take what the defense gives him? Um, point being, right? Colorado, I mean, blow a 29-point lead. Uh, we saw last night. And from a penalty standpoint, I mean, how many penalties were there just last night that – put Stanford right back in that game. So I think Colorado is talented, but I also think they have a terrible defense. I think their offensive line is in shambles. And uh, I think from a discipline standpoint, they're not the best group when it comes to that. So Arizona has a great chance. And look, when you have a top 25 defense in the country, when you have an offense that consistently can move the ball and you have the depth and you have the players at running back and at receiver, 
you're going to have a chance in every single game. Could Arizona win every single game? Yeah. Six more games. Is it likely? No. But at the same time, this isn't years past. I mean, we've got to get past the fact that this roster is good. This roster has players and it all starts, I think on the offense and defensive line, like we've talked about because Arizona in past years would just get blown out the line of scrimmage, just blown off the ball. And that hasn't been the case this year, just because you've got a plethora of guys, you've got depth, you've got a pass rush, you've got a defensive line that looks like it might be the best in the conference outside of Utah, obviously a lot of good things, Mike. And there are definitely some fun games ahead and Arizona has to show up every single game and they could ultimately win a lot more games than people think. Matt, the defensively though, that's where it becomes interesting for me because again, it's a little bit different in that you now you have defensive backs, you have linebackers and you have a defensive line. I don't know that there is a, a real discernible weakness on this defense. Again, I don't want to make it out like it's the desert swarm or, uh, you know, some of those teams, but it doesn't feel like that there is a real way to be able to pick on them. And I think that's just, again, that's what's just so baffling for me because I just wanted Arizona not to suck on defense this year. My whole thing was, just be ninth in the conference. Don't be dead last. <laughs> They're a lot different than that, dude. Yeah, yeah they are, and, and and it's talent. You know, they finally they have, they have some talent. They have some size. That cornerback is a Davis, who who came off of Mario his Davis, guy to yeah. come back and yeah. pick uh, the other play in front of him, and then he made a great play on a one on one on the outside. And I didn't realize this, Shu. You said this. I didn't realize Arizona has a bye next week, and this that's why this win tonight was so big because. You have a bye. You have two home games in a row. I think one of them is a is maybe homecoming, UCLA at homecoming. I mean, I'm challenging the Arizona fans to get out. I mean, this is the, – the schedule sets up for them. The two games that they're going to be favored are going to be on the road, and it's never easy to win on the road. Colorado, ASU, that's a, a rivalry game. But three games at home when you play – Oregon State, UCLA, uh, Utah, all three of them, they may not be favored, but they, they have a chance to win at home. And I'm I'm interested to see the Arizona fan base. It's been a tough few years, but I, this is where the, I challenge the Arizona fan base to come out. And, the net, you know, they get a week off, a ton of momentum, a ton of great talk, a ton of, you know, how, how good this team looks so far. I mean, conceivably, it could be six and one. Now, you know, I also go back to the Bill Parcells. You are what your record is, you know. So right. they're not six and one. They're four and three. They've done a great job so far. But they've got two home games they could win. And I would love to see the fans come out and support this team and, and get them over the hump. All right. Now, Schuster, I want to well, I want to bring up something that Jed Fish said in his presser. I like a feisty Jed Fish, by the way. By the way, Jed Fish has to keep the stubble. Jed Fish looks like when he has the stubble, it looks like he's going to go get – like drink some Folgers. He also strikes me as somebody that probably smokes like one cigarette a week, something like that, just like a, a contemplative. But when he's running, he's, he doesn't strike me as a Starbucks guy. He strikes me as a Folgers coffee guy. He's got to keep that stubble right there. And it looks really cool. You know what else looks cool? Shady Rays. If you could have Shady Rays with your Folgers, I mean, let's, you know, shut, shut everything down at that point. That's how cool it is. Check it out. Shady Rays right here. Exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out the best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use code PHNX for 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 250,000 people. All right. One thing about, uh, one thing about John Schuster is John Schuster absolutely detests recruiting. This is true, John Schuster, is it not? Oh, that's 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 very true. I also uh, detest that I almost cost you about a million dollars in fines when I was going to make some Jed Fish joke about how he smokes Lucky Strikes and how uh, 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 Fafita isn't a Lucky Strike quarterback, but maybe his backup is. And, but I avoided all of that because I wouldn't want anybody to get in trouble with any uh, uh, sneaky, subversive uh, cigarette advertising. So that did not happen. That was just an example of what might have happened if I had opened my mouth too soon. All right. Yes, that is uh, that is very no, but, true. But yes, the answer to your question, I bleeping can't stand recruiting. All right. You had to go watch Mike Bibby one time, did you not? In high school? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. But I'm going to tell you this, and this is where I like Jed Fish, and he had to do this. Long story short, the highest rated defensive uh, player uh, to ever commit to the U of A, Elijah Rushing, decommitted. Decommitments happen all the time. 
Um, his father then took some shots at Arizona saying that, uh, they needed a place to better develop their, uh, develop players and not only develop players, but win championships. Then he mentioned ASU as a place that he could see going to, to win championships. Jed fish today strikes back. Jed fish says, uh, uh, I think it's clear that we develop our freshmen here. Oh, he will not leave that undone. I like that a great deal. I'm all for gimmicks and games like that. Um, going forward, though, let's look at uh, let's look at this. Oh, by the way, I'm going to get a Del Taco cheeseburger today. I'm very Matt Mulebach owes me Del Taco cheeseburger. By the way, <laughs> oh, you too. Over your head. Um, but uh, now. Where is this feels kind of like, and again, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself right here, but this does feel like this could be the start of something big here, Shu. Again, I don't want to make it out like this is going to be turned into the team that destroyed Miami, but you knew back then, and Mulebach, uh, Mulebach was that team was kind of in when Mulebach was just leaving campus, like all the freshmen that came in there. Could this be something where you're about a year away, especially going into the Big 12 from being really, really good? Yes. Uh, it's also, there's a lot of mystery because you don't know how good the Big 12 teams are, too. Right. There's a lot of good football and a lot of Texas uh, area talent that that conference has. Uh, so, you know, it's a different style of ball with a different style of athlete that maybe, you know, I think that's going to be pretty interesting to see how, you know, the, relatively speaking, the West Coast influence is against uh, tech, uh, you know, teams with a lot of Texas recruits. Uh, and I'm fascinated by how that plays off. But it appears that Arizona is in a, you know, I don't, I don't expect Arizona to walk into the Big 12 and dominate the conference from the get-go. But I think, you know, the way things are looking, if the Cats clean things up, they're, they're, a, they're a very solid team with the potential to be good and maybe even better than that. They're, they're, one of the things that I've harped on, and you guys have talked about this in regards to the overall how, how the defense is played, Arizona, other than the USC game, Arizona has had a tendency to give up most of its scoring seemingly on the first drive of the game. And then their ability to adjust in game is impressive week after week after week. That's something that goes to, as um, Matt noted, uh, their assistant coaches. Uh, you can do that and get the message across to get Arizona to do what it's supposed to do after you got to see what how the other team is trying to attack you. That's something that now I think has gotten beyond coincidence and has gone to uh, consistency. And, and, and that's a good sign, I think, for this program as a whole. So it looks like you have you've you've clearly upgraded the talent. It looks like you're balanced on both ends of the ball, uh, and and your coaches appear to be uh, to do a good job. It's also very interesting when you win forty four to six, as opposed to losing by two in double overtime, that you look at your the play calling of your head coach a little bit differently as well. Uh, there were a lot of uh, you there was know, a I trick think... play that worked. The trick plays never work. The trick play actually worked down at the goal line there, John Schuster. There you go. That's that. Hey, that's a start. You know, I guess if you stick with it, that's something. But one of the things that good teams don't need to do is utilize trick plays. You use trick. You you utilize trick plays when you're so good at everything else that you have the team off balance. Uh, Arizona, it appeared early on in this process, was using trick plays to try to come up with some gimmick, those things work better to, and probably worked better today uh, because Arizona was doing everything else well. That's when that sort of stuff works and works effectively. Ben, this does feel like we're on the verge of something big. This doesn't feel like when we were covering Rich Rod when you went to the Fiesta Bowl and everybody was everybody was hoping that it would be something good, but you kind of felt like the bottom could fall out because it felt like a little bit like smoke and mirrors. This doesn't feel it'd be the case. It's not a fluke, and you've said it a number of times. I mean, we're going to look back at this recruiting class this past year, and it may go down as one of the best, if not the best, in, in school history, just with the talent you've brought in. And not only the talent, but just it could be such a critical turning point for what this program will be over the next few years or as long as Jed Fish is here because you have the talent, you have the personnel, and – you're starting to put together the wins and the performances on the field to prove that, hey, we're not necessarily a, a bottom D1 Pac-12 team, but we're up there. I mean, we belong in the conversation from a talent standpoint on defense. We have 
three or four guys on that defensive line that any team in the country would love to have on their team. Same goes for the offensive line, especially when everybody's healthy. Matt hit on Jordan Morgan and, and all these guys. I mean, they're fantastic. So the talent is there. The pieces are there. It's just a matter of building off of this year and next year's got to be exciting. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how it shakes up in the big 12, uh, just with some of these teams. But uh, uh, you're right, Mike. I mean, we're, we're right here. We're in the mix for sure. All right. Now, Mr. Matt Mulebach right here with, uh, with Arizona football, then the one thing that I really like to, that they're able to do, and there's a lot of them is that they're able to run the ball right now. I think good teams generally can run the ball. Even the Kansas city, well, the Kansas city chiefs are a little bit different because you got Mahomes, So whatever on that, but <laughs> the, the best Arizona teams were still able to run the football and run the football consistently. You look back at the 98 team, you had trunk candidate, you had Kelvin. Um, I mean, heck, even the desert swarm teams, you had Chuck Levy, you had Billy Johnson, you had, um, you know, you had dudes like that. This now feels like Arizona could say, we know what you're about. We have better players in front of us right now, and we are going to run the ball right at you. Matt Mulebach, it is aesthetically pleasing for me. <laughs> it is, and that that's that's all that offensive line. It's what Ben was just talking about. It's what Shu talked about earlier. I mean, it doesn't feel like you have to run a bunch of trick plays or run a you know, what was, what was the, uh, the, you know, the, the Texas tech type offense kind of yeah. quirky offenses. They can just line up, have a great O line and run it right at people. The running backs are great, but the O line is, is special. And I think they're, they're getting even better now. Who knows who's going to, you know, maybe people, a couple of those guys leave, but I mean, I, I wonder right now if Arizona played Mississippi state, I think they'd be the favorite. I think, and I yeah. think they would actually beat them right now because they believe in themselves. I don't think at that game, as much as they were trying to kind of figure their own identity out, I don't, I don't think they really believed they could beat Mississippi state until about the third quarter. And then not that it was too late, but just, you know, they had already kind of made some turnovers, et cetera, but this team believes in itself and they know now they can just line up. You watch the Washington, Oregon game. I thought Oregon should have won the game today because they ran the ball. They were a better running team as good as Penix was they were a better running team. And not that Arizona is as good as Oregon running the football yet, but they are getting there. And with that line, they can they can play anybody in this conference. All right. Now, John Schuster, I was just asked about having an OnlyFans account right mm -hmm. here. Yeah, yeah. I, I noticed that. Yes, you uh you broadcast that to the uh to the entirety of everyone who was viewing live and will view later. Now, let me ask mm -hmm. you this, Jacob By Frank. All means. What do you think oh, about yeah. me having my own side hustle as an OnlyFans person as well? Ben, you know with the kids, the OnlyFans are very, very big. Do I have a career at OnlyFans? Should I take the op offer up on this? Man, you got a long uphill battle in front of you if you go down that route. Uh, but you know what? I probably will not do it, but there's also no better time to become a diehard for PHNX. Go to gophnx.com. All kinds of cool stuff. You That's can even better than OnlyFans. Why it's wouldn't better you do than that? OnlyFans. Yo, go there, become a diehard. You can get the merchandise and sub subscribe, all of that stuff, and maybe a little bit more Jacob Franklin. I will wrap a little bit later. Maybe, maybe you might get some of that in there, but check it out. Uh, no better time to become a, a PHNX diehard. You guys want to hear me rap real quick? So I'm, so I'm very yes. excited. Yes. All right. We're going with some Eminem right here. Eminem. His palms are sweaty from mom's spaghetti. There's vomit on his sweater already. Mom's spaghetti. He's nervous and ready, but when he looks, he sees mom's spaghetti. I can just keep going about mom's spaghetti. How good is that? Incredible. Now, you know, oh, I'll, I'll call let the you record with, labels. Get them on the phone. I'll let you interpret uh, what incredible actually means in that uh, circumstance, but uh, incredible. I will say, in terms of your uh, side hustle, potential side hustle career, not that I'm an expert by any stretch of the imagination about what happens on OnlyFans, but I think there's probably a dearth of folks who drink Folgers and eat hamburgers at Del Taco. So you might have an avenue in there that could be a little bit more prosperous than you initially anticipated. I'm just going to put it out there and just say, we'll see. We, you know, as always, we're just going to let the fans speak. Oh, Only. another guy we got to talk about here. We haven't given enough kudos to Ben One White. And we saw this up right up there. 
Tanner McLaughlin, the other mm -hmm. back right there. When you have a good tight end, it makes the offense so much easier. I mean, again, you look at the good U of A teams that generally had good tight ends. This was Tanner McLaughlin might be an NFL prospect right there. Um, Pretty impressed. I'm pretty impressed by what they found out of T-Mac. And it also shows, too, that Jed Fish is a good developer of talent right there. And he... And I'll say this much. I mean, he's not the fastest guy in the world by any means, but he's got some legs on him when he needs to use them. That post route was was incredible. Um, I think it was like 38 yards. They lined them up there and, and threw down the field. And he's just so important because I think with the way this offense is set up, a lot of it I get is check downs, but a lot of it is those intermediate, intermediate, excuse me, the short passes. And when Arizona is in a third and five, a third and four, a third and seven, and you need to get the ball out quickly, He's traditionally that second or third read and a lot of defenses just because, you know, tight ends are overlooked a lot of the times and especially the way Arizona has treated them in the past. But a lot of defenses tend to overlook him and he's typically open. Noah's able to step up in the pocket, get the ball to him. He can get out in space and, and make plays like he did tonight. And not only that, I mean, he can block too on the offensive line as well when Arizona's running the ball. So he really is that uh, that tool in your toolkit that can do a number of different things and probably the most underrated guy on this offense for sure. Matt Mulebach, if you were a football player, you strike me as being a tight end. You got the tight shirt on right now. You got the flat brim hat. You're following greatness right there. If Matt Mulebach was a football player, I think he would be a tight end. Is this true? You know, I, I think I think you're looking at the older Matt Mulebach. Put on a little weight, you know, a little, you know, not 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 as uh, slim as I used to be. Broad I think shoulders. I been a, broad I think shoulders. I would have. I think I would have been a free safety. Interesting. Interesting. I think a I strong like safety, that. free safety. In the lines of a Chuck Cecil, you know, one oh, of those type of oh, guys. Oh, the hard okay. hitter. Oh, yeah, man. Hard. Hard. You know what? I think you would have played on both sides of the ball. You would have been a tight end who just bruised people for extra. What do they call that stat? Yards after catch? Oh, yours would have That's been right. off the charts. Yeah. He would have and been Travis Hunter if we were playing end, college football right now. <laughs> unfortunately, the problem is that you hit so hard on the defensive end, they'd throw you out of the game all the time. I'd, I'd be out. I'd, I'd I, get 15-yard mm, bullets. And then what would, you be, yeah, what would you be doing? You'd be spending Saturday night on a podcast. <laughs> that's right. I'd have – yeah, that's right. What? Let me ask you this. Okay, Arizona's had arguably the best tight end in the history of football on its team. It's got McLaughlin now, who's a great tight end. I think we've had some other good tight ends, Mike Lucky, guys like that. At mm -hmm. what point does Arizona become tight end you? We never left. We've always been tight end you. You might say some other teams like Miami or, you know, some of these other schools. Arizona is tight end you. We've got the best tight end ever. You forgot Brandon Manamuliana, my friend. Over yes. 100 starts That's right. That's in the right. NFL. Um I, one, I, of the weird I things, one, one of the weird things about Arizona in that regard is that the, it, it's it, it's a school of extremes. You have a list of about five tight ends who had, you know, you mentioned Gronkowski uh, and, and what, there are three or four others who, what, had 10-year careers or so in the NFL. And then a bunch of guys that nobody can remember that, cost a to that, that, that caught a total of two passes for their career. <laughs> hey, was Glenn Halla tight end? Was my guy Glenn Halla tight end? I think so. I think he was. Yeah, and I think he caught about two passes for his career. Oh, come on, man. Come on, Glenn. <laughs> no, he's being true. Yeah, I think honest. that's right. Yeah, I, I think it was two or three. Tight end. You're doing a good job being nice to Glenn, but I think he caught about two passes. Now, Hal will uh, correct us. So uh, one of these days says, really, it was five. We got it. Actually, it's actually four. <laughs> I think I think Hal had some pro uh, pro tryouts. So I think he was on the Raiders for a, for a camp. Yeah, I heard you. Were, I heard you were as well. <laughs> by the way everybody hey, i i tried i tried to tr i i was when i went to law school i actually went over to campus and i tried to uh make the football team as a walk-on but i would already use my four years of eligibility and that's and a they caught story. you that's too bad that's a would, okay would you have made the roster i was going to try to make the roster as a punter really okay. hmm. i was going to oh matt that's beneath you come on <laughs> What are you, Pat McAfee? That's All right. right. <laughs> By the way, Pat, Ma Pat All right. McAfee picked us to win tonight. Pat McAfee, let's go. Here, look let's at that. Pat McAfee. <laughs> there you go. Uh, pretending uh, that he's not uh, Bob. All right. Oh, got one of the super snaps back in. Before the USC game, they were playing Eminem in the stadium, and I kept saying, Mom's spaghetti. My wife said, who are you, Mike Luke? 
<laughs> yeah, no, I'm very good. I will wrap on Monday. Bone Thugs and Harmony. Um, I uh, very good. So be what sure not to watch. One of shoes. I'll see you at the crossroads. All oh, very good. Very good stuff. All kinds of good stuff. All right. Now, um, I'm going to keep wrapping. It's going to be part of the shtick right here. All right, guys. But before, before, hold on. Oh, oh, geez. Now you might listen to some of this nonsense and you're like, man, I got, I need something to put me to sleep. This is all garbage. <laughs> oh, geez. is here for you. Oh, geez says now, listen, your ears are dead. Here's what we're going to do. Oh, geez. Check out our friends at OG's Brands for yourself and try one or a few of their many delicious flavors. Check them out across all socials at OG's Brands and online at ogsbrands.com. To find them at a local dispensary near you, must be 21 years or up to enjoy responsibly. All right, guys. I believe this was a crossroads win for Arizona. Pardon the pun, crossroads of Bone Thugs and Harmony, biggest hit ever. If anybody else out there gets it, that was very, very good on my part. But, shoe, joking aside, this... I thought the jet fish hire was bizarre. I've stated that a billion times. You can certainly see the vision. Now, again, um, you could say some of the play calling, you kind of wonder a little bit at times as you know, you've questioned before, but the talent overhaul in short order is always has been absolutely remarkable. Yeah. Uh, uh, now in fairness, when it comes to crossroads, I'm much more on the Robert Johnson camp and uh, really enjoyed uh, the movie with Ralph Macchio and uh, I believe uh, Steve Vai playing as the devil. Uh, so, you know, if uh, Jed Fish wants to go in that direction and sell his soul to the devil to get better talent, why the heck not? One of the things that I think is uh, perhaps interesting in this mix is that and is is all of the air that Colorado has taken out of the room and I get it that's flashy but there's an and there there's an interest and Sanders is doing a great job up there too and moving them in the right direction and really Colorado doesn't have a whole hell of a lot of talent so getting any win and being as competitive as they are is a is a positive but there are a number of ways to run a program and I think for folks in Tucson you're seeing a steady approach because there's nothing particularly flashy about fish, you know, uh, he, he'll tell you he knows some people uh, and and the team goes out there and, you know, they hit pretty hard. Looks like they're getting a little bit better. They they there, there aren't a whole <laughs> hell of a lot of highlights there, Whereas whereas you have you have Sanders who everything is flash, you know, everything is look at me, look at me, look at me. And Arizona kind of is maybe developing, winning improving, progressing, steady. Uh, so there, uh, I think what it shows, and we'll see if this ultimately plays out because there's a lot of different atmosphere with NIL and some other stuff, but there are different way ways to win at the college level. And Jed Fish's vision up to this point, I think has done a very good job. I argued or would argue, I don't know if we had opportunities um, uh, when I was here on some of these broadcasts, uh, when there was some conversation about the whole Delora thing uh, and which quarterback that you went with, uh, where maybe this was going to be Fish's vision crisis, where he he had an idea of who his uh, foundational quarterback was. As a result of being in that foundational quarterback, he was going to stick with him. But I think at this stage, that that decision has been taken care of, and f we'll find out how willing to adapt to the vision crisis fish is and if he can do that and i suspect he will uh, i i think the writing's on the wall as to who's better for this program right now uh then there's reason to believe that that's another good step for arizona john schuster does not believe there's a quarterback controversy because he doesn't believe that Jaden delora will start ben one white what do you think about that and give us your synopsis on the game young buck I think he'll start. Um, I think Jed said after the game, Michael Lev and a couple guys put out there that uh, he's not going to discuss the quarterback moving forward as he as he shouldn't. I wouldn't be looking to give any insight into the opponent here in two weeks, but I think Fafita's clearly the guy. Um, I think the offense is better. I think that when you basically come neck and neck with two top 10 teams the way that they have and not only win tonight, but but blow the crap out of a top 20 team as well on the road, especially in a place like Pullman, it's homecoming. It's hard to play there. Arizona hasn't historically had much success up there on the road. I think it says all you need to know about just where this offense stands and where this program stands at quarterback um, moving forward. Um, great spot to be in. I mean, six, five games in front of us, excuse me. And I think every single one of them in one way, shape or form is winnable just because Arizona has the talent. They have the personnel on both sides of the ball, if everybody's healthy, 
to be competitive and and move the ball and win games. And as long as they're able to do that, Utah is going to be challenging just with that defensive line. But Cam Rising hasn't played all year. Their offense is in complete disarray. So if Arizona's defense can just play very well and, and play at the, the level that they have and slow things down a little bit, there could be potentially a shot there. There's not one game on this schedule where you can't find a blueprint or you can't find a, I guess, a credible talking track as to how does this team win this game? Um, I think Arizona's in a great spot. I think it's better from a expectation standpoint that a lot of us expected. I think even Jed Fish is a little bit surprised himself. So a great spot to be in here as we sit in mid-October. And at this point, barring big injuries or something catastrophic, Mike, I would be shocked if they don't make a bowl. Where did you get Snuffleupagus at? This <laughs> is the only elephant in the room. There is no quarterback controversy. Fafita will be the starter until he isn't. And when he isn't, then there's a controversy. There is no controversy. This is the only elephant in the room. Now you see it. And just like Snuffleupagus, now you don't. Just like controversies when it comes to quarterbacks. I will. We're going to talk about that Snuffleupagus. I've been over to your place and I've never seen that. That is fantastic. That is great. Where the heck did you get that, Shu? Yeah, where did How you did get you come that? come up with that? Why do you have Snuffleupagus? Why, like, well, why, I mean, why wouldn't, why wouldn't anyone have snuffle off? What is the story behind you pulling that uh, thing out? Uh, I went to a thrift shop <laughs> toy store. It was 10 bucks and I bought it. Like, <laughs> that, like in the last was... eight seconds. <laughs> no, no. The, the snuffster has <laughs> been around with me for years. Look at this guy. Yes. He's just never on broadcast. Although that, he's that... much better at podcasts than I am. Luke needs another podcast to, to understand the story of why you have a snuffle up. Guess I do need all. I'm actually very intrigued by this. But it's, but way, it's pretty damn funny. What do we think about when Noah Fafita throws long touchdown passes? What do we think about the phrase Noah's Ark? Oh, I like it. I like that. It's good. Is it not? It's funny. Yeah, that Did you good. come up with it, Mike Luke? Is uh, that yours? No, I actually came up with that one myself. Oh, I did. That, 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 then I love it. I love it. It's fantastic. <laughs> now, uh, as long as you have two Snuffleupagus on the arc, or if he can get two touchdown passes per pass, I think we'll all be in good shape. All right. I'll, the, I have nothing nearly as cool as that, but I do have this. Hold on. <laughs> I found this in my couch the other day. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes, it is. It's a dinosaur. T-Rex? Yeah, dude, Matt, if you ever need something to chew, I have this. <laughs> it's very is he, good. Is he Tarkanian and that's a towel? Why are we chewing dinosaurs? Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> Noah's Ark has the team, but Noah's Ark is good. I like it's this. Good. Anyway. It's good. Well done, Mike Luke. Well done. All right. Now, yeah, Matt Mulebach, good. a.k.a. Craig Bergman, a.k.a. Uh, Matt Mulebach. All right. Let's talk... <laughs> What do you do? Wrap this one up for us, Matt. You're the most successful person in the room. Everything you touch turns to gold. I hung out with one of your employees today at uh, um, Tap and Bottle. Jack. My I tried to Jack. get him to badmouth you as much as possible, and he would not say anything because he said that you were fantastic and you were a leader of men. Matt Mulebach, sum everything up for us. Look, you know, Arizona's in a tough position as a football school in that you know, it's a Pac-12 is really good football-wise, and historically it's been really good. And historically, there's a lot of great football schools in the Pac: Washington, Oregon, USC, Utah, Colorado, uh, Stanford. And what the turnaround Jed Fish has done, and it's not over. He's got a ways to go. He's got five more games. He's got a he's got a bye week. But I agree with all of you on this podcast that this was a signature win for Jed Fish. It was a it was a huge turning point. Let's see if they can use that momentum and keep it going. But as an Arizona fan, you got to love the hope. You got to love the the team he's put together. You've got to love the talent he's put together, the coaching staff. It's it's a great day to be a Wildcat, as I think Jim Livengood used to say. <laughs> I believe that is All right. correct. Before we start off, Jacob Franklin is entering the chat right here. Jacob Franklin. All right. Now, check this out. Uh, Matt Mulebach, how tall do you think Jacob Franklin is? 6'8". He is 6'8". Is he? 7'. Yeah, 6'7". Damn. Okay. You know what I've noticed about tall people? And Brody Dryden does this all the time, too. They always lie about being an inch shorter than they really are. Well, most people <laughs> like us, we say the world an inch taller. Jacob Franklin is the guy that is – Jacob Franklin is every bit of 6'8". I guarantee you this, Jacob Franklin. 
Impressive. No now, before we sign off, though, Jacob Franklin is a Back the A member, even though he went to ASU. What did you think about the performance today? And are you worried about Arizona playing ASU and maybe that gets out of hand? I mean, it's 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 uh, it's no seventy to seven in the cards. I don't think Jed has mm -hmm. that in him. He would probably <laughs> pull back the pull the brakes back a little early. Um, I don't think it's going to be a good game, but you know, it is what it is. All right. Like I said, we call Jacob Franklin the backbone around here because nothing happens without Jacob Franklin. He runs thirty five shows Literally. and <laughs> up with my text messages all day. So we very much appreciate Jacob Franklin. On that note, though. We will be signing off. Jacob Franklin also has a newborn, which makes this even more amazing that he's able to do this. So again, tip of the cap, tip of the flat brim to Jacob Franklin. <laughs> so on that note, for John Schuster, Mr. Triple Double himself, uh, Craig Bergman, uh, Ben One White, I am merely Mike Luke, the great Jacob Franklin as well. We're going to be back with you on Monday. A lot to break down. You've been listening to the AZ Wildcats post game, and thanks so much, everybody on here. Your comments are the ones that make this happen. You are all you're smarter than all of us, except for Mulebach, and uh, we appreciate all of you. On that note, you've been listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast. We're all silly like the mayor. 